I've got a lot of things running through my head, right? right? The biggest one is this <clears throat> this fear that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find my why. Because I'm 44 um, and I've lived quite a sort of, um, like a transient life. So I lived in the countryside, messed up my exams at school and went straight into working in television. So then I was only young, so I was just trying to make my mark and I thought, my why I guess I would have said at that time is just be great in TV that ended up on on television working on kids TV and again it was just about being all in in that period because it was quite intense and then I was only in my mid-20s when I got the chance to present Formula One for the BBC in the UK which doesn't happen to people of that age normally so it was all into that world like the the kids TV world kind of was left behind straight away and that's all I did and then I quite like taking risks. So I walked away from that after four years and got a job as a football presenter. And I've just walked away from doing that after 10 years. And I, th and I like when you say, well, ask your best friend, like, why do you, I don't think I have one, which is a strange thing to admit when you're 44. But the life I've lived means I've just gone from sort of in, intense work to intense work. And I love what I've done. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, what is why why have i done it okay so did you have a childhood yes okay good so you have a why we're good there okay so let's do a little let's have a little fun why don't we okay okay tell me a specific story of something you've done at any point in your career could have been an f1 it could have been football it doesn't matter as a tv presenter for children's television i don't care tell me a specific story of something you were part of or something you did that you absolutely loved and if every day was like this day or if every project was like this project you would be the happiest person alive. So can I just jump in here and ask, why is that an important question to ask now, Simon? Let's, let's, let's talk about it at the end. Okay. Um, oh, that's a good one. I think I would, I would probably plump for standing in the pit lane for my first ever Formula One Grand Prix. Okay. And it meant a lot to me because I was working on kids' telly and at that time people on children's BBC didn't get the chance to go and work in sports broadcasting. And I'd only had a meeting maybe about a year before um, where I told the story to the head of sort of talent for BBC Sport. Mm -hmm. I had a meeting with her because I wanted to be a sports presenter. And she said, well, what are your qualifications? And I kind of jokingly said, well, I got ENU for my A-levels. Ha ha ha, to a stern re response from her. And then she said, what about sport you played to a professional level? And again, I said, well, I played one game for the school football team. Ha, ha. And it, she said to me, these are the exact words, BBC Sport don't employ people like you. So I was like, wow, okay. And it felt like a shut door. So then it was about finding a different way, which meant I spoke to a friend who worked in the football department and I said, just give me an opportunity. And I used to go and travel to like third and fourth division football matches with an ISDN kit for about £100 a game. And it felt <clears throat> difficult because when you're on kids' telly, you get a false sense of like you're standing in the media because you go out and like kids are getting excited because you're there or you do an event and it's like hundreds of screaming children. You're like, wow, this is awesome. And then suddenly you're like, like just doing little bits of reporting. And I remember feeling this hit on my back and I remember turning around and these young like 17 year olds had thrown like a meat pie at me. And it hit me on the back and they'd gone, kids TV wanker. And I was like, shit, this is like, is this really going to lead to anything? So then when I finally got the opportunity to, to do the Formula One job and they offered me a one year deal with a very, very, very small increase in what I was earning, which would have been an awful lot less than the person doing it before, but they knew I wasn't going to say no. And then they said, the audience will decide in 10 seconds whether you are worthy of this job or not. I remember standing in the pit lane and I just felt alive. I was like, now, now you'll see like, I'll show you. And I, I get goosebumps. You talk, I get that now. And I think of that moment, you know, and you're very cut off. You're wearing earpieces, like ear defenders, because the cars are loud. You're maybe two kilometers from the production crew. You're listening to them down your ears. You're working with a 13 time Formula One winner, David Coulthard, a multi, multi millionaire team boss in the shape of Eddie Jordan. And you're a 28 year old lad from Norwich who messed up his exams. That, for me, is a moment where I go, whoa. Like, that was kind of cool. Tell me a... So I'll let me ask one quick question first, which is, you stood in the pit lane many, many times since then. Yeah. What was it about that one that, like, is the reason you want to tell me about it now? I think because it felt like the ultimate test, and it was either... 
I knew it was either going to be <clears throat> everything or nothing based on what happened okay. in that, you know, f maybe the first 10 minutes, the first 15 minutes. And, you know, it's easy to mess your words up in that moment. Sure, you sure. Know? Tell me uh, an early specific happy childhood memory. Not like we went to my grandparents every weekend. Something specific that I can relive with you like it's a film. Um, waking up in the back of the car with the sun coming through the window. Didn't have much money. We only ever went camping as a kid. And that feeling of you've been carried into the car by your mum and dad. And I but tell me a specific one. Specific I time. Um, I would have been about eight years old. We were heading towards France and I opened my eyes and my mum was there. And I remember her leaning across and scratching the back of my dad's neck to keep him awake because he mm -hmm. was tired. And she passed me an apple and I ate the apple and I looked across my brother and sister in the car. And of all of the magical things you did as a kid, all the lovely memories, what was it about this one that you're choosing to tell me about it now? Um, just total, con like just us five. Like just real connection to my parents and my brother and sister. But you had connections with your parents every time you went camping in the car, and you know, I yeah. want one that stands out, one that sort of chat, happy children. And you can keep going down this road; that's fine. But I want to know you had that experience of sitting in the back of the car. Yeah, your mum probably trying to keep your dad awake. You know, was there something in particular about this one, or is that just one you found to try and capture the general the general memory? Um, I think it was because my parents were really busy. So my mm -hmm. dad used, my dad was a charity worker, but also was doing a degree while we were kids. My mum was a full-time teacher. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't loads of, like we weren't a family that did loads of stuff, actually. Mum and dad were, like they worked basically. <clears throat> and then the weekends were a list of jobs, Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And they're still like that even now in their 70s. They just have, you go in the house, they have a list of jobs all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just like that was gone and it was just, we were just together at those moments. So that's why that stands out far more than being at home really like I, I wouldn't really pick up on anything so it's the, the the joy of going on the adventure with the family yeah or maybe two people who are more adult than you yeah yeah kind of like the formula one example yes right so the, yeah, those guess, stories yeah. are very very similar which is wasn't you standing by yourself in the pit lane right it was you said it was these two people that you're standing with you know a race car driver and a and a multimillionaire team owner you know kind of like mum and dad you know a charity worker and a teacher who are highly qualified people but in that moment you're just a family and you're a part of that family and you may be the youngest least qualified person but you're still a part of the family yeah and uh those those two are exactly the same story that incredible sense of like oh my god like this is it i love this i'm in the car with them yeah you know this is this is it and everybody's relaxed and we're enjoying ourselves and i'm i'm a part of this you know, and they see me as equal. Yeah, yeah. You know, they didn't look down on me. And you said, I feel like I've arrived. You feel like I'm here. But it was also that they treated you that way. Yeah. You know, and so your why is very much, your why is is very much about um, um, feeling a part of the family, feeling a part of the team. Um, and I would venture to say that you're at your happiest when you are working with people in common cause to do something together and where you struggle is when you're asked to do things alone. You absolutely, I mean, you know, no longer being a football presenter and focusing on high performance is, that's exactly what you're describing basically. Yeah. You know, when you're a football presenter, you're working with a load of sort of former footballers and a load of producers and VT editors and everything, but you're kind of, it's a very, it's a lonely thing. You're the, you're the only presenter, right? What I love about high performance is this sense of all of us, whether it's myself and Damien, the production team, anyone, this is just like, what can we all do together mm -hmm. to have these kinds of conversations to help the person on the other end of this podcast or watching this somewhere? And it wasn't about the destination, it was about the journey, which is, I don't even yeah. know where you were camping when you said it was about what you brought up as being in the car. Yeah. And I, I would say that it's being in the studio or being in the pit lane, like it's being somewhere with the quote-unquote family and here family now is a variable right people you love and who love you and you're going to do this together and even if you don't know them very well they're going to treat you like all right we're all in this together we're all yeah. going to the same place how do we work together as opposed to against each other you know very often teams the the the, the, the players on teams will work against each other because i want them to notice i want the producer to notice me yeah i want i i don't care about you in fact i'm going to put you down so that i get the promotion or i get the better billing you know so yeah. I'm see stand that flies in in the face of everything i think exactly everything exactly and we're we're here it's just a group of people with different points of view in common cause basically go back to that analogy 
right? So now we can go back to our Brian dating story. When somebody says, what do you do? Well, I have a podcast called High Performance. I'm a co-host, blah, blah. Okay, that's what you do. It's, unless somebody wants to be on your podcast or produces podcasts, yeah. it's not that interesting. Um, but now you have a story of love. And you can talk about either one. You can talk about the Formula One story or you can talk about your childhood story. It doesn't matter. And so when somebody says, what do you do? You'd be like, it's a funny story. When I was a kid, maybe eight years old, I remember we went on a trip and my mother was always busy. She was a teacher. My dad was always busy. He was a charity worker. And here we were as a family going somewhere together. And I just remember that intense, magical feeling of being a part of the family because when we weren't in the car going on camping, it was just work. It was just lists of things to do. It was just getting work. And here we were now, this is the time I felt like a family. And if I look at all the times I've been happiest through my whole career, and I can, I can, I can point to all those uh, times, there was always a sense of a group of people in a, in a, in a proverbial, you know, sort of in a, in a metaphorical car in a t on a team where we felt like a family going in a common direction, trying to achieve something together. And I love being a part of that. Yeah. And the amazing thing now is I love what I do now because now I'm on the pod, this podcast and I'm not the host, I'm a co-host. And now I might be sitting in the front seat. I might be the mom and dad and we've got all these young kids coming with us and we're going to go on this journey together and try and learn things together. And it's the same magical feeling I had when I was a kid in that car. I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> so it, it turns was, out you do have a why. It, so it seems. <laughs> Can <you>. we explore <laughs> what you've just done there, Sarah? Because that's incredibly powerful just to bear witness to it. I'm interested in why did you choose to go to a childhood memory and then a professional memory? Just mm -hmm. explain that for anyone listening that might want to be ask themselves those questions. So it's about pattern recognition, right? Human beings are we a why is this deep seated thing inside us that drives us and which means there's some consistency you do not remember all the experiences you had as a child you remember the ones that matter to you right you remember yeah. the ones that stand out in other words your brain keeps those because for some reason they're connected to you so for example you know on our website um uh like we have a why discovery product and what it'll do is it'll take you through your whole life and it'll ask you tons of questions about your childhood it'll ask you about your early career your middle career because if you're doing it with someone or or for yourself it, you want lots and lots and lots of data points so you can find those patterns i'm just really really practiced and yeah. i'm doing it for a while so i can do it with fewer examples i know what i'm looking for but that's basically what i'm looking for i'm looking for common examples um, i'm looking for connections and patterns and i'm listening to language and i'm finding the the analogies and as soon as i see a, a thread what i started doing when i was thinking out loud is i'm now trying to describe the thread and i'm actually paying attention to how you feel so when you said oh i'm getting goosebumps now when i talk about this story i'm like okay this matters to him right he's having an emotional response um and i'm just watching him while i'm talking about it and he's nodding or I'm, he's going to wince me and, okay i'm off i'm off track because i don't actually care what you think i want to know how you feel as yeah. i'm trying to describe back and mirror back to you what i think i heard um so it's it's just pattern recognition is all it is right it's incredibly powerful Can and 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 the reason it needs an outsider to do it i couldn't do it for myself yeah right, right? is because you have no objectivity ob objectivity on yourself right and you'll see patterns that don't exist you need somebody who doesn't that's why that other example is said don't do it with family because they know you too well yeah right um um and they'll start filling the gaps for you as opposed to being as objective as possible um so it's much easier when you do it for a friend hey guys it's jake here listen before you go please do me just one favor hit subscribe it makes such a difference to us the more subscribers we get then the bigger the channel becomes the bigger the channel becomes the bigger the names we can attract and the more impact we can have for you so thanks for watching and please subscribe right now